All right, we are going to talk about diagnostic quality today. If I can get the slide to advance. Here we go. These are our objectives. So we want to define visual and geometric characteristics that affect image quality and then explain their effects. We want to discuss the factors controlling the visual and the geometric um, characteristics that are controlling or that contribute to the diagnostic quality. And then we want to discuss the rules of accurate image formation. So what helps an image to um, come out uh, accurately or just like what the real tooth looks like in the mouth. Analyze film for diagnostic quality and suggest ways to improve quality and then summarize diagnostic features on a radiograph. So to review a little bit, what is translucent? Well, you may think of, or what is radiolucent? So what I tend to think of is translucent. If something is translucent, you can see through it. And in an x-ray, if you can see through something, it um, looks black. The, the more, uh, the less dense whatever it is that you're taking an x-ray of, the blacker it's going to look. So it's translucent. Whatever you're taking an x-ray of, there's not a lot of density. It's, I like to think of seeing through it. So you're seeing through it. An example of that would be airspace. So structure being radiographed lacks density and it permits the x-ray photon to pass through with very little or no resistance at all. Opaque, I like to paint. And so when I think of um, radiopaque, I think of opaque, I think of white. So it's opaque, it's white. In my brain, that's where it goes. And the structure is very dense and it absorbs your x-ray photons. It um, keeps them from reaching the sensor, depending, or keeps a certain amount of them from reaching to the sensor, and that's where you get your shades of gray. But um, an example of this would be bone, enamel, and of course the whitest of the white would be like an amalgam filling because it's um, incredibly dense and it's just going to absorb all the x-ray photons. So ideal diagnostic quality of an image. So the, the most ideal state of a, of a diagnostic image would be that its ability to provide a great deal of information. You're able to see many things in that film. In just taking one good quality x-ray, you can see all the things that you're hoping to see and be able to diagnose, diagnose from. So the things that are um, in play here are the density of the overall density of the film, the overall contrast of the film, same size and shape of the object being exposed. So when you take an x-ray of a tooth, you want that image of the tooth to be very similar in size and shape to the real tooth in the mouth. Very little, you want to avoid distortion. You want very little distortion. And then you want your outline of that image to be as sharp as possible, hoping to have as little blurring or fuzzing around the the tooth or around um, whatever it is that you're looking at. Visual characteristics. So density is the first one here. So film density is the um, degree of gradation of blackness of a film. So it's kind of the overall darkness or lightness of a film. So if a film is too dark, you lose, um, you lose the ability to see detail. If it's too light, you you lose the ability to see detail. So you kind of want it right in the middle. You want some good contrast so you can see the light and the dark, but you also want to see those shades of gray so that you can identify things within the picture or within the image. So visual characteristics, um, some more on density. So the primary factors that influence film density is going to be the MA, so the milliampere seconds. Higher MA equals higher density. So if the MA is increased in the on the x-ray machine, then the image is going to be darker. There's going to be a higher overall density. KVP, kilovoltage, higher KVP, it's going to lead to higher density. If you have more powerful penetrating uh, x-ray photons coming at the sensor, you're going to have an overall higher density. Your source film distance. The larger the space is between the source and the film or the two, um, the um, 
BID and the film, the lower density. So this is that inverse square law. If you space out the space between where the x-rays are generated from and the film or the sensor, every you know, when you break that down into like every inch or if you double this distance, it gets more and more, you can think of it as getting diluted. It's getting more and more diluted because of that way that the x-ray beam kind of spreads out like a flashlight. The beam is strongest way close to the source and then it sort of dissipates and spreads out. Example, double, doubling the distance gives one-fourth of the de de, um, density. So if you double the distance between the source and the film, you're going to get one-fourth as dense of an image. Having the distance gives four times higher the density. So if the closer you get, the more dense you will be. Too much density is a dark film and this will conceal information. It'll it, just think about like turning out the lights, it's too dark, you can't see anything in the room. Too little density is really light and this will destroy detail. Think of flooding a room so full of, of light that everything just gets whitewashed. You just don't, you can't see the detail. So it's too extreme the opposite direction. Visual characteristics density. So here we have an image on this one um, on the right of the screen that um, the density is very high, it's very dark, and then you have um, a picture on the other side that actually looks pretty good to me. I mean there's a little bit on the molars that looks a little bright, but overall there's actually quite a quite a decent amount of shades of gray in that image. Secondary factors influencing density. So the secondary, and actually, let me just go back here really quick. Okay, so just focus here. These are the primary factors that influence um, density. MA, KVP, source film distance, those are the three. Those are the primary factors. Now we're talking about secondary factors influencing density. Um, developing conditions. So underdeveloped, underdeveloped films are too light, overdeveloped films are too dark, the speed of the film. Now some of this stuff doesn't influence density so much anymore because we are doing digital. So we're not really seeing so much of these types of effects. But if you go into an office where you're actually developing it, you're changing out the chemicals. Um, you have to be aware of the temperature of the chemicals and the concentrations and how old the chemicals are. Um, or maybe you've done that in the past as a dental assistant. That's when those things can actually truly affect the, the traditional film and the density. Film contrast. So now we're going to talk about contrast. Contrast is the difference in densities seen on the film. Shades of gray in a radiograph. So now we're talking about all the variations between the extremes of white and black and then all the shades of gray in between. So there's two different ways of um, describing contrast. We can describe it in a long scale and we can describe it in a short scale. Now if you're talking about a long scale, it's low contrast, meaning in between each tile, let me get my little cursor over here so you can see, in between each tile of color, it's a low contrast between, meaning there's little difference between this black that's a little lighter, little lighter, little lighter, little lighter, little lighter, and it goes along in a long scale as, and you get lots of shades of gray, many shades of gray between black and white. High contrast, think of a high contrast is you've got like very few options. You've got black, maybe a couple shades of gray, and you got white. So it's a short scale. You go from very dark to very light, very fast in a short scale. Factors that influence film contrast. Example of loss of contrast caused by film fogging. So when you have very little detail or your contrast is um, very, very, uh, let's say you have a very long scale so that there's, the, the contrast is almost muted. It almost looks foggy. There's just not a lot of difference. You can't pick up that, um, that detail because the dark things don't look as dark and the white things don't look as white. A higher KVP is a lower contrast, lots of shades of gray.
So, um, and then MA has no effect on contrast at all. So increased KVP um, actually ends up having a lower contrast or lots of shades of gray. And this might start to get a little bit confusing because when we think about higher KVP, we think about higher density and a darker film. Um, and so then you think, well, how, isn't it just overall dark? But it's overall dark and you don't get a lot of the white. So that's where you don't have that contrast. You have a low contrast. It's just a lot of dark shades of gray, perhaps. Why is KVP the only factor that influences contra contrast? So why doesn't um, MA affect contrast? So we have long wavelengths. So we know that KVP, if we increase the KVP, we have a lot of long wavelength um, X-ray photons from our primary radiation. And then we have something here called the step wedge. And each one increases in thickness just a little bit more. You can see that it's like just a little thicker, a little thicker, a little thicker. And this gives us that... Um, that gives us the ability to see all the different um, all the different changes in the result of the x-ray when we have all these different thicknesses. So down here we have a KVP that's low, 40. And so that low number, you get very dark, very dark, very dark. And then all of a sudden it's very light, very light, very light. And it's like it's low KVP, it can penetrate really well, and then all of a sudden it really can't penetrate very much. And so you just get white. It's like it absorbs it. So let's see if this shows. Um, I think it, yeah, I think this kind of is, so remnant radiation, aggregate of silver deposits on the x-ray film. So radiographic image is seen on the illuminator. So you can see it's like it's getting through, it's getting through, it's black, it's black. It's sort of like halfway gets through and then it stopped completely once it reaches a certain thickness. So that's with low KVP. It, it affects it quite a bit and then it's just absorbed and it can't go on. And then here and with a short wavelength, the more penetrating power and with the higher KVP, because with higher KVP we have shorter wavelengths, um, higher frequency, shorter wavelengths. And so it penetrates incredibly well down at the the, the skinny end or the, the thinner end, it penetrates very well, very well, very well, maybe a little less, little less, little less, and then it finally is getting absorbed and is leading to white. So that's why with a higher KVP, you're going to see more of a reaction. You're going to get it from going through super easy to not going through quite as well. So that's why you get the grays and then you get the being absorbed completely and then you get the white. So I hope that makes sense. And MA doesn't control the frequency and the um, wavelength of the, or the, the power of the X-ray photon. So that's why we don't have an effect with MA. Because MA is just the number of electrons available, if you remember that. Okay. So how to remember the difference between high contrast and low contrast and short scale contrast and long scale contrast. So high contrast, short scale, black and white. So think that they're highly contra highly contrasting. I don't know if that's a word. Um, a very different. They're highly different. Black is totally different from white, high contrast. And think of it as short scale because there's only two. There's black and white. So you can, you know, we're kind of simplifying, but that's how one thing you can think about it. Short scale, few steps, few shades. Low KVP is a result because you just can't, they they get through pretty well and then they just can't get through anymore. So you, you end up with a very short scale um, and very high contrast. Um, then we go over here to our low contrast, lots of shades of gray. There's no big jumps from light to dark. It's a gradual scale, low contrast all the way through. It's a long scale because of that. Many steps, many shades of gray. High KVP gives us that because we have, you, you know, it goes through all the way, not so much, not so much. Then it's absorbing and we're back to white. So here's long scale low contrast, lots of shades of gray, increased KVP.
long scale, low contrast, lots of shades of gray, increased KVP. Summary of visual characteristics. So density, MA and KVP, both control film density. That's the blackness of the film. You increase both MA and you increase KVP and the film density is increased. When KVP and MA are fixed, the exposure time is the most important factor controlling density. So in our clinic, KVP and MA are fixed, but we can control exposure time. So if we pushed the molar button when we're doing a maxillary or a mandibular anterior, um, anterior PA and we, we had it on the molar um, setting, then it would be darker. The film would turn out darker because we don't need that much um, exposure time when we're doing the mandibular or maxillary anterior. Contrast is only affected by KVP. It's the only thing that controls contrast is KVP. All right, geometric characteristics. So sharpness, so the three um, ge geometric characteristics that we're going to talk about is sharpness. That's reproducing a distinct outline of an object. Magnification, equal enlargement of radiographic image. Image shape distortion, variation in the true size and shape of the object being radiographed. Um, how am I going to pronounce this word? I was looking at it earlier. Pen penumbrum, penumbra, penumbra, I think. So that is referring to the fuzzy, the fuzzy outline of an image, the unsharp margin surrounding the radiograph or the blur. And it's really impossible to a hundred percent. I mean, some, I think as technology improves, um, penumbra is probably getting better. Um, but a lot of times you go into an office that is still using older equipment because it's, it's very expensive. So unless you have something that's very updated, um, penumbra is almost always in an image. But if we have everything right, if we have positioning of the film right, if we have settings right, if we have, um, the source film, um, space, um, right if where the patient doesn't move if the tube head doesn't move all of these factors um, come together I then will minimize the penumbra geometric characteristics so image unsharpness can be minimized by keeping a film as close as possible to the object so when our sensor is as close as we can possibly get it to the tooth we're going to have a sharper image and by having the source film distance as long as possible. So our um, BID, the source of the of the actual x-ray photons are inset quite a bit. So even though we want to get the end of the BID really close to their cheek and we want everything snugged up, the actual source of the x-ray photons is quite a bit a ways. And by doing that, it actually creates a stream of x-ray photons that is more desirable for a, for a more accurate image. So that might be confusing to some people because they think, well, we're always snugging the target right up to their cheek and putting the BID right there. But the end of the BID isn't where the x-rays are generated. They're not the source. That's just the end of the long um, collimator. But the source of the x-ray photons are actually set in a little bit in the tube head. So image unsharpness can be minimized by keeping the film as close as possible to the object, keep your sensor as close as you can get it to the tooth, and by having the source film distance as long as possible. Source film distance long, object film distance short. We want to keep the film, and in the paralleling technique, we you can see that we have to sometimes put the source or the... Um, the film, sometimes we have to put the film back a little bit in order to get it parallel with the tooth. Um, so it's all a balance. There's many factors involved to help us get a good picture. This is a part where they would, the instructor would demonstrate some things in class, but we can't do that, but hope, I think I should be, maybe I can make a separate video where I do the demonstrations that they used to do. Okay, five rules of image formation. So the first rule, x-rays should originate from a small, from as small a focal spot as possible. So the tungsten target on the anode is very, very tiny. And this is a small focal spot 
where the x-rays are generated from. So it's not a big old, just big chunk of tungsten and and who cares, you know, the size. It is tiny, a half to 1.2 millimeters. Think of your probe. Think of the the probe you use and the millimeters. You're starting to measure, um, well, actually, I don't know if you guys have started measuring, but if if you have looked at your probe yet or, t- or thought about your probe yet, you're going to start measuring um, periocharting and um, pocket depths in millimeters. And it's a half a millimeter to just a little over one millimeter. It's very small. The distance, the second rule, the distance between the focal spot or the source and the object examined should be as long as um, practical. And that's because as the x-rays go flying down the collimator, flying down your BID, if it's a long BID and a long collimator, it actually, um, it actually focuses them in more of a, in more of a, how do I say this without using my hands? Cause you guys, I, I have taken my image out of these recordings because I realized that there's something about the noise that's generated when I have my picture, um, something something changes in the settings, and it's it still makes that rackety noise. But if I take the camera out, it doesn't make the noise. I have no clue why. Um, but I wanted you to hear me more than see me, so um, sorry. But so think of a flashlight that you can control the. Sp- Span of how much the light disperses, if you could actually control that and keep it more narrow as it goes forward, um, that's what's happening with a longer um, distance between the source and the object. If you have a longer BID it, and the, the source is set back, then the, the shape of the dispersing of the x-ray beam is actually more controlled and narrowed. So the film should be as close as possible to the object being radiographed. We want to put our sensor as close as we possibly can to the teeth. The long axis of the object should be as parallel as possible with the film. We know this from our paralleling technique. And the central ray should be as perpendicular as possible to the film. This is going to give you the truest representation of the tooth if these um, these rules are are adhered to. Summary of diagnostic features viewed on film. So an image should not be too light or too dark. That's the density. We want it somewhere in the middle. The fix, the five basic tissues should be seen. Um, this is contrast. We want to see enamel. We want to see a difference between enamel, dentin, pulp, the alveolar bone, and all of the kind of the variation in the bone and um, the cortical plates and um, all of these things to see how, you know, the bone is the bone health. And then soft tissue, you can actually see the outline of like gingival tissue. Periodontal space, the lamina dura and the bone um, trabecula should all be seen and, and that's sharpness. So that's being able to see these very fine outline means that the outlining of our image is nice and sharp, which is, is what we want to go for. The buccal and the lingual cusp tips are superimposed on each other. So this is distortion. So if the cusps are not superimposed, if we can see two distinct buccal and lingual cusps, then there's some kind of vertical um, angulation error. All um, needed structures for an accurate diagnosis can be seen. So that's coverage of the placement. Did we place it accurately so that we can see all the structures that we can make an accurate diagnosis? Okay, buccal and lingual cusps are not superimposed. So in this image, you can see the buccal way back here. It's kind of fuzzy, especially like here. You can see buccal, buccal, and then here you can see lingual, lingual, lingual. And so um, this is an example of that. And then here sometimes, so sometimes it's going to be... um, Sometimes you you might see that in bite wings, and so you might say, oh, this is vertical angulation, but sometimes you're also looking at um, maybe one cusp is higher than the other, and so that's why they're not superimposed. But like here, this is a good example of them pretty much superimposed on each other. This is pretty much superimposed on each other. There's a little bit of um, of a separation here and here and here and here. You can see the lingual and the buckle in the back. So a little bit more, but by and large, you can't really change that in, in a, in a bite 
wing. And then here is your PDL. I'm not sure why this is. I'm not sure what this image is doing here. Let me advance it, see if something pops up. Nope, that was it. Okay. Well, let me pause it there. I'm going to look back and make sure that I did not miss anything. And then we'll go on to analysis of errors and artifacts in films.